and help you out. They're gonna they're gonna be doing service projects. Um, you'll be able to bid on their time. Uh, I know a lot of you are familiar with how that works because the local schools do that a lot for senior projects. And then we will be having hot hamburger and hot dog stands in town. Um, what are we saying? Four or five times before then to also raise money. Um, and then we will be doing a dinner service. Um, at some point, we don't have the date set for that yet. And we will be making a spaghetti dinner. And um, people can sign up ahead of time. We'll do like a drive through in the church parking lot and we will be taking your meals out to you. And we'll also be taking meals to the fire department and the police department here in town. Um, we might have a movie night. Yes, we're, we're discussing having a movie night here at the church uh, with the Christian movie. Um, we've also told the kids, I know a, a lot of you older ones and myself, you were taught, you don't work, you don't eat. Right. They don't work, they don't go. You know, That's right. you know, they have to earn this because this is a very, very expensive trip for as many of the families as kids. Yeah. 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 I'm the grandmother of this bunch. They will work. It's a little bit opposite of that most times at the youth group. So when it comes to ice cream. So when this summer while we're doing this, they, the teams are going to be required to help with all of the fundraiser events, be present there. They're also going to have to have um, very good attendance during church services as well as youth group services. Um, if they don't work, they don't eat, just like she said. So uh, they're going to earn their way on this trip. And our goal is 5,500, yes, to raise before um, August 4th. August 4th. So God is good. Um, my husband always says, God's will, God's will. And we have faith that we will reach that. And these kids are going to work hard for it. And we're really excited. So I thank you all in advance for your participation and support for our youth group. You guys have always been amazing in supporting our youth group, and we love you guys, and we really appreciate it. Good morning, Lighthouse. Good morning. It is great to see you. Are you glad you're at the house of God today? Amen. Hey, it's sunny outside. Well, they said it was. But we'll, we'll take it for that, right? It is sunny. It's going to be almost 80 degrees today, they said. But so we'll see. But nonetheless, it's a glorious day. And I want to be the first to welcome you as the pastor of this church, as to say, Happy Mother's Day. Amen. Come on, church. Happy Mother's Day. I'd like to read the scripture this morning, and then I'll ask my wife to come up and share for a little bit here. Uh, it says the scripture in Titus chapter 2, it says, The older women, that they, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the younger women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, Good, obedient to their husbands. Do you know what I mean? Husbands? No, I mean, you better not follow these kinds of. That the word of God may not be blasphemed. You know, and there's a lot to that scripture, but even older women to teach younger women to be keepers of the home. And in today's world, there's a lot to managing the home. And that's not talking about just cleaning some dust or vacuuming. It's talking about managing a home. And that's a huge, huge uh, project is to teach one another. And so I'm so grateful for our older women. I won't ask the older women to stand. All older women stand right now. And it's like, oh, no. But we do appreciate you. We need you. We need you to be able to teach each and every one of us. So that being said, I'd ask my wife to come up and share. Good morning. Good morning. And happy Mother's Day to everyone. I would like to have all our mothers stand, please. 
Not just the older you, ones. No, all of you are mothers. If you are a mother, please stand. Look around. Look at all of you. And now, if you have a mother, stand. <laughs> <laughs> I have a few things that I'd like to share about Mother's Day. In Ephesians 6, 1, the verse says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on this earth. So I hope all the kids... Anybody who's a child, which is everybody, yeah, that's right. I hope everybody listens to that and follows that. God designed the family. He composed it of a father and a mother who lovingly care for their children. Right. I'm very blessed that I grew up with a father and mother who loved my brother and myself endlessly, and they cared for us wonderfully. <laughs> I realize not everyone has a mother who cared for you as she should have. Let me encourage you. You're only responsible for your part in that relationship. Romans 12, 18 tells us, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. That includes all those who don't treat you as they should. As Christians, through prayer and the work of the Holy Spirit, we must choose grace, love, and forgiveness. The same grace, love, and forgiveness that was given to us by our Heavenly Father. Ultimately, we're adopted into the family of God and this family of believers. I encourage you to seek out relationships and friendships within this family of believers. But since this is Mother's Day, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my mom. She's here today. And, well, it's always here. <laughs> when I was young, she worked hard to make sure we had nice things and wore nice clothes. I know there were times that my mom sacrificed for us and went without buying things for herself to make sure we had the things that we wanted and the things we needed. There were times she stayed up late when I was a child, helping me with a school project or a Valentine bo Valentine's box that I neglected to tell her about until the night before it was due. <laughs> <laughs> but she always pulled through and came up with a wonderful idea for it. She also made prize-winning costumes for us. She cooked delicious meals, and she gave us the discipline that we needed. It's a blessing to have a mother like this. Children depend so much on moms. From the time they're born until the time that they need advice on having babies of their own, and well into adulthood. Now I have a little poem that I'd like to read. It's called Everything Mom. How did you find energy, Mom, to do all the things you did? To be a teacher, nurse, and counselor to me when I was a kid. How did you do it all, Mom? Be a chauffeur, a cook, and a friend? Yet find time to be a playmate. I just can't comprehend. I see it now, it was love, Mom, that made you come whenever I'd call. Your inexhaustible love, Mom, I thank you for it all. So I encourage each of you to reach out to your moms. <coughs> Give them a hug, give them a call, tell them you love them. And I want to thank all you moms and tell you happy Mother's Day. And when you leave today, we have uh, just a little token of appreciation uh, for each of you on your way out. So we thank you. How about all guys stand and just say thank you for our mothers? Come on, guys.
Jesse Priest, he can come on up, please. As they're coming, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we glorify you, we praise you. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the institution of the family that you set up. And for those amazing ladies that brought us into this world. And Father, that for equipping them and giving them the strength beyond their own capabilities. And Father, we thank you for your mercy and your grace that you give to us each day. Father, this is a glorious day. What an awesome day to worship you and praise you. And Father, even today, when we get opportunity to be able to give our tithes and our offerings in the boxes in back, I pray, God, that you're, you're, you just would bless it and that you would grow this kingdom, that you would rebuild the, uh, the institution of family as it is ordained in your scripture. I, I pray, Lord, for the, the parents that even today have worked so diligently and maybe still trying to catch their breath in just coming to church today. Lord, I pray you reward them, you strengthen them, and Lord, thank you for godly mothers. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <clears throat>
mighty God. Yes, yes. He's the one that encourages us. Yes. He gives us hope to make it another day. Yes. Praise yes. our Lord and Savior. <laughs>
We thank you, God, for your mercy. And we praise you, God, Almighty God, that you've forgiven us of all of our sins, that you've made us righteous in your eyes. We pray to you, God, asking for your blessings, your strength, your mercy, your comfort. Meet us right where we are, Spirit of God. We glorify your name. Spirit. 
on, church, just sing that a cappella, please. Holy Spirit, rain down. Holy Spirit, rain down.
catch all the bad stuff now. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's somewhere between a, a son for me and, he, and he's my brother. We spent, spent a few hours out on the prairie together on horseback and gathering cows and having good conversations. And, and uh, he's taught me a lot. And I appreciate him. I hate this family, believe me. Yes. And, we're going to move on and God's going to bless them with it. Yeah.
But that day, it was in January, I think it was, or maybe the first of February, that you moved to Fort Scott. He didn't know, but he, when I met, I didn't know you that well. And I remember that you said, you found it out there was a need, and you said, we'll take care of it. And you moved there. It was amazing. It was amazing. But that's, if I shouldn't be, that's the church. That's what the church is about. Speaking of which, my turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. As we're studying the book of Acts, and it is called the Acts of the Apostles, but it also can be called Acts of the Holy Spirit. He's the writer, the revelator, the creator. He's the one who, who brings people to Christ. And we'll continue our study in Acts chapter 2. If you'll turn there, please. It says here at the beginning, we'll read just the first few verses. It says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues, <coughs> as a <of> fire, <coughs> and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Verse 5. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together, and they were confused, because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Isn't that amazing? It goes on to list all the nationalities. And then jump down to verse 13. Others mocking said, they are full of new wine. Hey, I want to tell you something. When there's a legitimate move of God, there's always going to be someone mocking and saying that that's not of God. Right? There's always be someone saying that can't be God because they're entrenched in the world. But we see an amazing experience here. Wouldn't it be great if we were to have any given Sunday, let's say we went to the college and all the foreign exchange students, we invited them to the service. This would be really cool. Amen. And if we invited them to the service and they were from all nationalities here at this church on a given Sunday. And God was so blessed me with the gift of tongues in that everyone understood in their own language. Hallelujah. Wouldn't that be cool? Hallelujah. I mean, no interpretation needed, and they would all be baffled and say, is he Asian? Is he from, from uh, other ports of the country? It would be amazing. Wouldn't that be awesome? I mean, how can you deny that? But someone still will try. But that's what happened here, is an amazing move of God and the, they, they stood up and proclaimed his glory. Let's first lay some groundwork talking about divine power. <clears throat> what this occurred on Pentecost, the day of Pentecost. That occurred 50 days after Passover Sabbath. And another name, uh, which is another name for Feast of Weeks, or the Feast of Harvest. One of the Three great festivals Jewish people celebrated in Jerusalem. This was Pentecost. Remember, Jesus appeared to them for 40 days after his resurrection. And he said, wait, wait in Jerusalem that you may be endued with power from on high. In Acts 1 verse 8. And then they waited for better part of 10 days. Because it's the 50th day. It is Pentecost. And it says around 120 were in an upper room. An upper room. And they were waiting for the power of God to fall. And he did in an amazing way. Now the word spirit in both the Greek and the Hebrew describes wind or breath. 
Here the idea of wind captures the impact of the Holy Spirit. Just as man did not exist until the life-giving breath of the Almighty God, so the church did not come alive until it came forth the breath of the Holy Spirit. The breath of the Holy Spirit. The very thing that we breathe, the life-giving breath, that he came on the day of Pentecost in a loud fashion. Can you imagine that sound and that a rushing mighty wind? I can't even do it, even the mic. How loud that would be. Wouldn't that be cool? I mean, could that happen today, friends? Could that happen? Could it? Well, yeah. Some of us would go like, praise God. Other ones would go like, what's going on? And others would go like, something's wrong. I'm out of here. Hey, don't run from God. Run to God. Say that again. Don't run from God. Run to God. He is God. And you, we believe that God can do miracles today. It blows my mind, actually, that someone is, is in need of a healing in their body. And they'll call a pastor. They may not have attended church for years. But they'll call a pastor and say, would you pray for me, please? Why are they calling me? Because they believe in the power of healing. They want it. But when it comes to other things, they go like, Hey, I'm going to stay home, do my thing. That's out of my comfort zone. I, do you know you have a comfort zone? Yeah. I have my comfort zones. We all have our comfort zones. Some people I'm amazed at are uninhibited. Uh, there's one in particular that comes to mind. I won't mention him. But he amazes me that he just... I remember at his wedding. You know who I'm talking about. I remember at his wedding that they had a dance after the wedding, and he was up there having a great time. Me, I can't move and rhythm for anything. I, I try, I stumble and fall, that's how I move. And matter of fact, we believe in praising God and clapping. We believe the scripture says that, but don't follow me, I'll mess you up. And I can't <laughs> seem to get that down. But boy, I tell you, he was uninhibited, he was having the time of his life. And I, I think that's great. I'm more inhibited than that. So we all have our comfort zones, and that's okay. God made you that way. And that's all. Don't try to be something you're not. So we're not here in this church saying, I want everyone to be just like me. If that was the case, you'd probably be a mess. We are unique. And God made you the way you are. Don't try to be something you're not. Just obey God. It's that simple. We see here that they were waiting on the day of Pentecost, and they obeyed. And the Spirit of God moved in an amazing, mighty way. Even in Genesis 2, verse 7, it says, Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. Isn't that amazing? That we think we're so secure or tough, or we think that we are... Will live to be uh, 150 years old. I don't want to live to be 150 years old. The aches I'm feeling at 59, I can't imagine what it'd be like 150 years old. Come on, right? But the, we don't really think about it. The reality, how fragile you really are, because without air, you can't live. God brought breath into mankind. We became alive. By the same token, the church is to be alive. Did I get someone to say amen? amen. Alive and well. I want to talk to you about dead, dry bones. Dead bones. Dead bones. It's in Scripture. It's in Ezekiel 37. And it's talking about Israel. But I'll be reading from Ezekiel 37. There are dead bones that live. Now, I know it's talking about Israel. I don't want to take it out of context, but the reality is that symbolism is rich. It is rich. It says in Ezekiel 37 this, The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out into the, in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of dry bones. Have you ever seen a valley of dry bones? Or even a death valley? Have you ever been there? Or even areas where there just seems to be nothing living. A barren area. We've traveled and seen barren areas where the road would go for miles. 
and it seemed like nothing was alive. And what's your thought? Man, I hope the car makes it, right? I don't want a flat tire. And your cell phone reception. How many of you, we are so used to cell phone reception. But when you get in those areas, there isn't even cell phone reception. Well, I tell you, that would give you a prayer life. Oh, Lord Jesus, help us make it through this dead zone. I have no cell phone, so I need you, Lord. Come on. Is it kind of like we get all of a sudden we trust in our stuff, but we start trusting God a lot more when we're really in the valley of the dry bones. Well, it goes on to say, then he caused me. <clears throat> then he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed they were very, very dry. And he said to me, Son of man. Can these bones live? Can they live? So I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. And again he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live, and I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord God. Amen. Amen. Verse 7 says, So I prophesied, as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise. Can you imagine that clanging noise? That'd be, I want to see that. I, I'd like to see this. Wouldn't you? I mean, yeah. the valley dry bones, bones all over, prophesied, and also the bones are clanking. Can you imagine that? Or can you kind of hear that pattern going on? And, and it says even a sudden rattling. The rattling of the bones. And the bones came together, bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and flesh came upon all of them, and the skin covered them over. But there was no life in them. There was no life. There, there was a form. The structure, the body came together, the bones came together, sinews and skin, flesh. But they stood there, and there was no life in them. Now, I want to ask you a question. If you've been, been in various churches, have you ever, don't answer this out loud. <laughs> have you ever been to a dead, dry church? Don't say, yeah, well, I walked in the, no, 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 no. don't you dare. <laughs> Come on. A dead, dry church? I mean, they got the form down. I mean, they know when to stand, when to sit. I remember I was raised in a church. I'm not saying whether it was dead, dry, whatever. I'm just saying I knew when to stand. I knew when to sit. I knew how many songs. Why is it when there's five verses, we only sing one, two, three, and five? I don't know. I don't understand why we do that. Or skip a verse. Sometimes it's applicable. But the reality is that we always did it. We always did the same routines. I knew what to do, where to, how much. I knew how many songs. I knew I led in this church songs. And I remember just that sometimes, not always, it seemed kind of dry. I want to say. I mean, we had a form. We have a form of godliness. And Paul told Timothy, I have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, turn away from it. My friend, if you're attending a church that is dead, dry religion, there is no life in it, then the Spirit of God, if He's left the building, you need to follow Him. Right. Yes. Just say. No Just say. Because I tell you, without the Spirit of God, there is no life. I mean, you can be very religious. You can have your form down. But there's no life in it. Amen. My friend, when you go to Texas, look for a church that has life in it. Life giving blood. That brings life. Because the reality, you can't even be saved except the Holy Spirit draws you to Jesus Christ. Amen. So find a church that has life in it. Well, Pastor, what are you saying? It has to be one that we're rolling in the aisles and running every Sunday. I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying that. I didn't, I'm saying the Spirit of God is there. Some of the most powerful services I've been in is when it was such, you could hear a pin drop and people were weeping 
and crying right. and falling on their faces. Yes, yes, that's right. The power of the Holy Spirit. We see here the Valley of Dry Bones and they were very dry. They had form, but no life in them. Let's go on. It said, and also he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds. O breath, and breathe on those that are slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came uh, into them. And they lived and stood upon their feet and a singly great army. So wouldn't this be amazing to see the valley dry bones, the bones come together. They're standing there, but they're motionless. There's no life in them. And God says, breathe life. And when life came upon them, they were alive. They were well. They were an army fortified to fight the battle. Hey, we need to be a church that's alive, that's well. Yeah. The Spirit of God is moving. The yeah. breath of life is yeah. coming. And then we're alive, ready for this battle. Because you're facing a battle outside these walls. Right. You're facing a battle. Yes. Today's Mother's Day. And some of you that have raised children, you know how tough it is to raise kids. <laughs> you better think it over before you start. Uh, amen. That, that goes to marriage too you better think it over before you start marriage is awesome it takes a lot of work amen. my wife didn't even say anything on that I thought she would say anything it takes a lot of work hey we've been married 39 years I'm highly trained professional this says oh man I got a lot more work to do right uh, It says in Scripture, actually in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, we are confident in all this because of great trust in God through Christ. It is not that we think we're qualified to do anything on our own. Our qualification comes from God. He has enabled us to be ministers of the new covenant. This is a covenant, not of written laws, but of the spirits. The old written covenant ends in death. But the new covenant, the spirit gives life. King James would say, the letter of the law kills, but the spirit gives life. Hey, we can get caught up. As a matter of fact, we can, in church, get caught up in arguments over doctrine. Boy, that's so productive, right? I know even in those 39 years of marriage, our marriage has grown because of all the fights we've done. And man, look how far we've come. No. No. I've always said conflict is inevitable. Combat is optional. Think about it. We're going to have conflict. Do you believe that even in this church, we don't all think the same? Yeah. What? Hey, I give you the right to be wrong. That's all right. Yeah. Think about that one. <laughs> we don't all think the same. But you know what? You're my brothers, my sisters in Christ. We are one in our differences because we agree on God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Yeah. We are one. We worship an almighty God. And he takes our differences. And he qualifies us and brings us into the holy of holy. Yes. He brings us in. Maybe today you're here and you felt like unworthy to even be able to come into the holy of holies. I'm going to tell you some great news. Jesus Christ paid the price for all your sins. Your past. Your present. Your future. He can be ushered into the holy of holies. Well, I bet today thought this is going to be a Mother's Day message. <laughs> it is. I'm praying for the mothers as I go through this. All day long. <laughs> Thank you. In 2 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5, it says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come from excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined, Paul is speaking, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We are a Christ-centered church. Yeah. 
Christ and the church. I was with you in weakness, in fear, in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom. There's a lot of human wisdom in the church today. <clears throat> but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Take an amen of that. Amen. So even in praise, worship, preaching, the service all over, it ought to be spirit-led. And you might be changed. Because I could be the most charismatic, dazzling preacher, best dressed. I don't know, I threw it off. Whatever. That's not going to save anybody. It's the Spirit of God using somebody. To bring God glory right. and give Amen. you the power to make it another right. day. Paul even said that your faith is not to be based off man's wisdom. Right. Hey, I'm okay. I'm great with seminary. I'm great with PhDs and theology. That's all right. But that doesn't make them any greater than the man or woman that will humble themselves before God. And he calls you and equips you to proclaim the word of God. That word is powerful. It's powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, able to cut right to the heart of the matter, to the mark. So we are to be basing it on the power of God, the power of God, the message. You know, this is probably one of the most profound messages that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, yet it wasn't real long. Someone say amen on that one? Amen. And well, he wasn't long-winded. He, he got their, well, I'm sorry. God got their attention. And they were ready to listen. Hey, I'm going to tell you something. God needs to get some of our attention so we'll finally listen. Can I get an amen on that one? Oh, man, that was weak. I might have listened. So we know that the message was clear. What he preached was Jesus Christ and him crucified. He said this. He said, you know the Messiah. He was here. You saw him. He was here on this earth. And he said that he performed miracles. And you witnessed them. You saw Lazarus come to life. You seen people be healed. You saw him overcome and even cast out the demons. You witnessed it. You know. You know he is Lord. And you killed him. You killed him. You killed him, and not so much so, you nailed him on a cross, a cruel crucifixion, and he died on that cross. You did that. You did that. And it says that they were about as quiet as you were. They were convicted, and he said, but it doesn't stop there. Because that same Jesus that you killed, that God allowed him to be on that cross, he was buried in the grave. And he said, you know what happened? He arose from the dead. The death, even death, could not hold him down. Nothing could hold him down. And Jesus Christ, whom you killed, he's alive. He's alive. As a matter of fact, he's exalted. And he's seated at the right hand of the Father. Now, you Christians, believers who have given your life to Christ, saying, Amen, praise God, let's go. Amen. Amen. But you who have not received Christ ought to be fearful. Yeah. Very fearful, because he's alive. Amen. He's alive. And he paid the price for you. And if you don't receive Christ, you will stand before a righteous God with all your garbage. You know, when I say that, it came to me. <clears throat> now, maybe you're in your, maybe you worked or run. Some of us even run a garbage route. And I, I tell you, one of the things in my life I wouldn't want to do. Our, our son's a mechanic, but uh, I wouldn't want to be a mechanic on a garbage truck. <laughs> I'm sorry, I mean, you know, it, I've never, I've never come across a good smelling garbage truck. Unless it's brand new. Isn't it weird? Our garbage all smells the same, just like garbage. 
I don't know, is it just me? It all swears. It's bad. I, I really admire you guys for the routes you run. I praise God for you. Yes. You take away my garbage. Amen. Hey, you know what? I don't want to stand before a righteous God and take all my garbage. And here it is. And he says, you can't enter in. Because you still got your garbage. This is how you smell. Scripture, to put a scripture to it, it says your righteousness is as filthy rags. Yeah. But I'm a good person. You still got your garbage. Sure. Yeah. And what's cool, and I have this visual, and I hope I don't take away from the truth of the word, but it's almost like we take our dumpster to heaven, and I walk up there and we say, I know Jesus. It's empty. It's empty. There is no garbage here. It's gone. And I throw that thing back, and I can walk in his glory. Because your garbage is gone. But it's only because Jesus Christ paid the price in full and you received him as Savior. He's your Lord. He's your Savior. And I'm proclaiming Jesus all the way to heaven. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. But if you don't know Christ, you open that up and it's full. It's full. And you can't go in. As a matter of fact, it will, they will usher you to another throne. Yes. It's called the Great White Throne. Of judgment. <coughs> and you will be judged. Yes. See, you're going to be going with one of the other thrones. The judgment seat of Christ. Where you are made whole because of Christ. And he welcomes you in. Or the great white throne. Which is the doorway to hell itself. Well, how could a loving God send anyone to hell? Because of your choice. Right. He provided a way for your garbage to be gone. And you're set free through his son. But if you say, I don't want Jesus, I want to do it my own way. Well, then it's all there. And you've made a choice. You've chosen. See, Jesus Christ ascended to the Father. And he's exalted at the right hand of God. One of the most profound scriptures I think of is Stephen in Acts 6, when he was being stoned. And I, I, I want to talk with Stephen when I get to heaven. I, I'm going there. I'm, I'm, I assure you, I'm going there. I have been sealed with the Spirit. I have the guarantee of salvation. I'm going to see Jesus, but I'm also going to see Stephen. And I kind of like to talk to him. Because he was one of the first in Acts 6 that were full of the Holy Spirit. And, and he was serving God. God was using an amazing way. And they stoned him. They stoned him. To death. Now, if someone's throwing stones at me, what do I want to do? <clears throat> right back out. But he said something that just resounds with me, the same thing Jesus said. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Wow. That's my brother. That's Stephen. And I'm about to ask him about that. What was that like? But that's amazing to think about. The reality is that Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. And what it says with Stephen is this. As they were stoning him, he looked up to heaven. And he could see Jesus standing on the right hand of the Father. Isn't that great to think? Can you imagine that, brother and sister, that you live the life of Christ and it's coming to the end. It's coming to the end. And you're at that point, and you look up, and God gives you a vision. And Jesus isn't just seated at the right hand of the Father. He's standing at the right hand of the Father. Boy, that's blessed. As I get yeah, chills yeah. down my spine. And he's saying, come on up. He's, come yeah, on hallelujah. up. Come on up. Yeah, hallelujah. Standing, ready to receive you home. See, he knows you by name. In John 10, it says that he even knows the very hairs of on your head. And he said, Pastor, that's easy for you. Don't have that many. <laughs> hey, he knows, and by the way, why is it when people come to our house, they look at our family picture from 30 years ago, and they always go, wow, this is what they say every time. They say this. They say, wow, Lisa, you haven't changed a bit. Wow, Scott, you used to have hair. <laughs> Why do they do that? Right? Right? 
That's what we got. So, okay, there you are. There's two things. Lisa, you haven't changed a bit. Wow, you used to have hair. Okay. But I still got some. <coughs> but he knows you so well, he knows even the hairs on your head. Yeah, he knows you that well. In Acts 237, you see their response. Their response. They were cut to the heart. Why? Because Peter had said, that same Savior that you killed, he is alive and well and exalted and seated at the right hand of the Father. And you're going to give an account. And they were cut because they know what they've done. They saw it. They saw it. They had seen Jesus hanging on the cross in excruciating pain. They had witnessed darkness for three hours while he was on that cross. They had witnessed that. And now he's alive? What have I done See, for you to be saved, you must come to the point what we call repentance. What have I done? You've heard people say, hey, everyone, just say this prayer and you're saved. That's not all true. You have to be cut to your heart. You must repent of your sin. And that word repent, we throw it around all the time. Scripture says, likewise, except you repent, you'll perish. It's in Luke 13, 3. What does that mean to repent? It means repent derives from two Greek words, meaning to change oneself, turning from trusting self to trusting God. To repent is to change. To no longer trust yourself, I trust God. I let go. They were cut to their heart, and they said, what must we do to be saved. I'm doomed. I'm lost. I'm a sinner. I've even killed the Messiah. What must I do to be saved? That's a legitimate question, isn't it? What must I do? And Peter said to them, repent. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. And, I love it, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit to repent, to turn your ways. Now, so when we talk about repent, what about baptism? Does that mean everyone who's baptized is saved? Well, if that was the case, I know a lot of people that got baptized that they ain't acting so well. They're not living quite right. So the reality is that baptism is merely this. It's an outward demonstration of the inward reality of Jesus Christ in a person's life. Listen closely. It's not a requirement for salvation, but a requirement because of salvation. That's what we're saying again. <clears throat> Baptism is not a requirement for salvation, but because you are saved, born again, born from above, sealed with the Spirit, it becomes a requirement because of your salvation. Why? Because it's an opportunity for you to come into the what we call the watery graves of baptism. And we believe in immersion because what you're doing, I know Jesus Christ. He's my Savior. And I want to reenact what He did for me. So thereby, I will come into the water and I will come in and I will die to myself and I'll rise to walk in newness of life. It's a proclamation to the world. It said, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I will live for him. If someone here today has never been baptized, I encourage you strongly to follow through with your salvation and be baptized. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promise. The promise. That's a promise that was to you, to your children, and to all those that are far off. You'll read the next verse. The promise. So I was raised 
in a church I told you, I cherish the teaching and the memorization I was taught. But when it comes to the area of the Holy Spirit, he was more or less, we believe in the Spirit, but he's like a force that's out there. I was even taught from a church that miracles don't happen anymore. That's amen. Say it aloud. And I realized the gravity of that statement. That was from a pastor that I was under. That miracles don't happen anymore. Well, when I read my word in Romans 1.16, it says, uh, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation. So if you deny miracles, there is no salvation. It's just works. It's the letter of the law. But the Spirit brings you to life. In 1 Corinthians 12, 3, it says you can't even come to Christ except the Spirit draws you. I believe in miracles. Can I get me? I believe in the power of God. I believe in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. All three are involved in our salvation. I believe in the promise of the Holy Spirit. I believe that God keeps his promises. Even today. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So in that teaching that I was brought up in, it was like, okay, you've given your life to Christ. You've been baptized and you're on your own. He's coming back. Oh, yeah. But you're on your own. Now go and live this Christian life. I want to tell you something. <clears throat> to live the Christian life without the power of the promise of the Holy Spirit is impossible. Right. That's Amen. true. Amen. 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 Come on. It's true. It's true. It's impossible. The only way I'm living for Christ is by the Holy Spirit who keeps convicting me. Right. Makes me a better husband. Yes. Makes me a better yes. father. Yes. Makes mothers a better mother. Yes. The power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yes. That's the only way. If you're trying to be a better Christian and without the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, you're not going to make it. Mm -hmm. That's a miserable place to be. Mm -hmm. Here's an example. In closing, it's Mother's Day, so I won't go too long. He's saying, Pastor, why don't you listen to Peter? Make it just a little shorter. <laughs> but we know that it's like this. If you try to live a Christian life without the power of the Holy Spirit, it's kind of like this. It's like God says, you have to high jump seven feet to make it to heaven. So you work at it, and you work at it. You work out, and you, you're almost at, you're at 6'9". My brother there, he's at 6'11". He's almost got it, but not quite. And then he dies at 6 feet 11 inches. <coughs> nope. Didn't make 7 feet. You were really good. You were ahead of me, but you didn't make it to heaven. Isn't that miserable? Yes. You don't even make it. Yes. But when you finally get to the point of surrender... When you fall on your face before Jesus, say, yes. I give up. And that's what he did to me. He spoke to me literally at a point in my life when I said, I give up. And he said, now I can use you. That's right. Amen. Now I can use you. See, he comes to the point of saying, cut to your heart, say, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus says, repent. Give your life to me. Be baptized. Surrender your life. You lose your life, you're going to find it. That's what it says. You'll lose your life to find it. Die to yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me. And I've said it in my terms, and get off your dove and get to work. That's my terms. Did you know that God, okay, I said I was short. He just keeps coming. Did you just know that God called you for a purpose? The brother's covering motivational gifts on Wednesday nights to encourage you to come. But he called you for a purpose. And it's not just your good luck. Some of you are really good looking. Some of you are kind of like me, right? You are. No, why do you say that? I don't know why I said that. <laughs> Who knows what? Maybe that was less anointed than other things I've said. 
Hey, we battled our flesh too, right? But he didn't call you just because your looks or your charismatic personality. He called you to go to work for the kingdom. Not just go to church and go home. He called you to be the church. Each and every day. Well, today is Mother's Day. And so thankful that I had a godly mother. I had a mother that poured into me. She was my spiritual leader. She, she was there for me. My mother passed away in 96. She was 56 years old. But she, the, the effects of the impact she made on my life, on all my siblings, all my siblings are faithful to God. That's because of parents, because of a godly mother that poured into them, taught them to surrender your life to Christ, taught them to obey your Lord, and, and let the Holy Spirit move through us. The power that you have is huge, ladies. I may be the head of my house, but my wife's the neck that turns the head. <laughs> Amen. A lot of influence. Hey, I'll show you a lot of grace and mercy, but you mess with my wife, it's fine words. Right? Because that's all right. That's the way we're made. Ladies, the impact you've made in God's church and with your, the ones you've raised and are raising or thinking of raising is amazing what you do. My mother told me when I was 16 years old, says, you're going to be a preacher. Now, I preached my first message when I was 16. It was a half-hour message I did in 10 minutes. I talked really well. <laughs> I was so nervous. I went like this. I thought like that. And you could understand that. You probably thought so many times. I didn't want to like that. I just got like that. I need interpretation. I couldn't say that. <laughs> and now you're saying, you won't shut up. <laughs> hey, ladies. We are so thankful for the impact you made. Each and every day. Not only did my mother make a huge impact on myself, but my wife has made a huge impact on me and our kids. A huge impact. When she was speaking of her mom, I will say I could see her doing the same things. Same things. You know why she won't speak of herself? Because she's humble. I will. And the impact that you made. You made. I see it. I see it. Ladies, it is amazing. <laughs> We love you. We appreciate you. And the last song today is Run to the Father. And my friend, what better gift could you give your mama, guys, than to give your life to Christ? There's a lot of mamas been praying, maybe you, for a long time. My friend, I'll tell you, never give up praying for your kids. Never stop praying for your kids. The Father is hearing you. What you're saying. Amen. Keep praying. I want to tell you, as pastor of this church, I pray for you. Some of you wake me up at 5 or 6 in the morning. I'm praying for you. I, I get so frustrated. Tell me you woke me up the other day. You didn't even text me or call me. I just woke up and started praying for you. And you. And you. It happens all the time. And I don't say that. I don't play with that stuff. I'm saying it's real. Because the Father loves you. Yeah. Loves you. Today would be a great day to run to the Father as we worship Him today.